Hello again, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this Monday, Memorial Day edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. Uh, first graphic here showing 24-hour uh, precipitation around the state, and you can see a fair amount, half an inch or more, fell over the eastern Alaska range. Uh, east of Fairbanks as well, and southeast of Fairbanks, over toward Denali, again that half inch mark there. And then uh, kind of a dry condition, then back into some precipitation over the Yukon Delta and the southern Seward Peninsula. And then the North Gulf Coast, uh, seeing anywhere from most areas seeing more than half an inch rain, especially in the upslope areas of the coast range there, and that uh, extending over to the northern pan and mostly uh, over east of Juneau the heavier rainfall there, and also some, uh, looks like, wetting rains up into the uh, Koyukuk and westward toward the Kobuk Valley there with lighter amounts into the Noatak va Valley. Next slide here, dropping some rainfall amounts again for the last 24 hours. You see Delta Junction had nearly six-tenths of an inch of precipitation, and uh, some areas uh, in and around that area, a little bit more into the Alaska Range, had up to as much as eight-tenths of an inch. And Northway onto the southeast, they're picking up about a third of an inch of precipitation. And Gulcana, Copper River Basin, they had two thirds of an inch of rainfall. And this uh, causing rivers to rise, but uh, no flooding expected other than just a rise in the river, especially uh, along and uh, streams draining the Alaska Range. Heaviest rainfall amount was about an inch and a third down at Cordova, while Portage had about 1.10 inches. And also out to uh, Seward Peninsula, Nome, in some uh, moderate showers, picked up nearly four-tenths of an inch of precipitation. So all this rain kind of translates into much reduced fire danger uh, over the interior, uh, barely getting into the high category there for the Yukon Flats area after seeing extreme for the last several days there. And uh, not even registering as high now, farther to the south, Tanana Valley. A couple of uh, spots just really touch and go into the high category. Near the Yukon River out west there, east of the Lotto Hills, and then uh, southwest of Tanana. So uh, rainfall and cooler conditions and clouds and less wind really helped improve fire dangers of what we saw yesterday. And for the breakup map, of course, uh, mostly open now in the Noatak River. All the other streams are open freely flowing, and the north slope, uh, not much going on. The Kaparik now became unknown after being mostly ice. And looking at the uh, Colville, still a big stretch upstream from Umiat uh, of the unknown variety, and then some open becoming mostly ice out toward the coastline, and uh, some open now along the entire stretch of the Saguan River. So really a uh, breakup season just about ready to wind down and end here. So moving on to satellite imagery, you can see a uh, band of clouds from the northwest coast areas actually bending up from the uh, St. Lawrence Island area and extending down into the eastern interior and actually all the way down to the North Gulf Coast with low pressure near the Perbloff Islands. And so that's uh, pulling those clouds back to the from north to south and from the northwest into the eastern Aleutians there and then some kind of gusty winds across the Alaska Peninsula today on the eastern quadrant of that low center with uh, rain, areas of light rain and showers with winds gusting 25 to 35 miles an hour, Bristol Bay and the Alaska Peninsula, with Port Hyden seeing gusts to 35 miles an hour. And sunshine restricted now, kind of a partly sunny day over the upper Yukon Valley, but not uh, like yesterday, but Arctic Village, Eastern Brooks Range, now the sunniest location in the state with uh, clouds, light rain, and areas of showers. Kind of a cool, damp day for the panhandle. And of course, the uh, rain starting to taper off in the North Gulf Coast, so, but showers persisting. And uh, not much out to the west, just a lot of clouds 
and uh, disorganized clouds with showers tapering off as you head out toward uh, the far western Aleutians, weak high pressure over the western bearing into the Russian Far East, and slag gradient across the uh, northern bearing sea into the Chukchi Sea, and that dense fog at Tin City down to a quarter mile visibility in dense fog, and some rain showers out of point lay along that trough extending from that weak 1,003 millibar low just east of Wrangell Island. Next, standing southeastward, and then we pick up the heavier, more persistent rainfall from Fairbanks eastward and uh, down across the Alaska Range, as we saw, into the Copper River Basin, all the way down Prince William Sound, showers of Kenai Peninsula, Manuska, Susitna Valley, some showers around, as well as the Panhandle showers and rain there, with uh, amounts generally uh, anywhere from a few hundredths to uh, a third of an inch. And then that trough out over the eastern Aleutians, Alaska Peninsula. Gusty winds, again, 35 miles an hour at Port Hyden with light rain, fog, and drizzle. And for tonight, uh, possible flurries and fog along the Arctic coast, uh, especially the east central coast there, otherwise dry over the interior. Light winds, Chuck C. C. to look for low clouds and fog there, and maybe picking up some light rain and drizzle for St. Lawrence Island. That all translates into low flying conditions, IFR, as uh, we'll see in the aviation products. And the Bering Sea, that weak 1,005 millibar low, continuing to weaken, and uh, but it keeps it pretty uh, damp and cloudy and drizzly and foggy out over much of the central and eastern Bering Sea and showers uh, hanging onto the panhandle and rainfall letting up and becoming more showery and tending to shut off toward uh, morning over the eastern interior. Warm front, next system spreading rainfall to the Shimia at in the two area late tonight toward morning. And uh, that warm front kind of breaks off into a trough and slides some moisture into Adak and Atka during the afternoon hours with the main front back to the west, keeping it wet over Shimia and Atu. And the low over the Bering Sea drifting to St. Matthew Island now, really not weakening too much more. And it's not all that strong currently, but uh, that'll keep it showery and cool over the Bering Sea. But winds won't be much of a factor at all. Maybe a little gusty along the southwest coast, and that's about it, maybe 25 miles an hour in the more exposed locations. But looking at a chance of showers in the afternoon over the inland areas of Kodiak Island, better chance for Bristol Bay, Southern Cuscombe Valley to the Yukon Delta, as well as the Alaska Range, kind of a cloudy, mostly cloudy, showery day for the areas south of the Brooks Range across all of Alaska to the North Gulf Coast and in across the Panhandle. And looking at the outlook for Tuesday, we can see that storm on the bottom of the chart there, south of that 1,027 millibar high center that uh, winds up pretty well, 990 millibars. And that's going to act to uh, slowly move north and northeast over the next several days. That's going to allow upper level ridging that's currently up over the Arctic Ocean to expand southward and then maybe a little to the west. So we should start as early as Wednesday, start uh, seeing increasing sunshine across southern Alaska, temperatures edging at least into the mid to upper 60s in many areas, even the Copper River Basin, but staying kind of showery over the interior afternoon. Some of the taller clouds could develop into an isolated thunderstorm or two and becoming mostly sunny over the southeast coast. And possible gale force winds ahead of the next front, pushing into the, especially the ADAC area and eventually into Atka. So moving on to the lows for tomorrow morning. Upper 20s, lower 30s for the Arctic coast, 30 to 35 for the North Slope, and then milder Arctic Village, low 46 with maximum sunshine and uh, low about 50 there for Fort Yukon, otherwise mid 40s in the central interior, Northway and Eagle into the upper 30s, mid 30s, mid to upper 30s, Copper River Basin, and uh, much of South Central Alaska, upper 30s to lower 40s, lower 40s, Kodiak Island, near 40, Bristol Bay, the Alaska Peninsula, mid 30s for the Pribilofs, and lower to mid 40s for the Panhandle, about 40 for the Aleutians. Highs tomorrow, cooler, nobody even coming close to 70 degrees, upper 50s to maybe mid 60s, warmest over the upper Yukon Valley, and near 60 over the western interior to the Seward Peninsula inland areas away from the coastline. Otherwise, Nome at about 51, upper 30s for St. Lawrence Island, mid 40s along the southwest coast, 50s for Bristol Bay, lower to mid, and mid to upper 50s or mid 50s, give or take here, south central Alaska. Same thing for the Copper River Basin, lower 50s, Prince William Sound, 
lower to mid 50s for the Panhandle and lower to mid 40s out over the Aleutians. Lows again falling a shade below freezing along the Arctic coast, uh, but not too far. And 30 to 35 again for the North Slope and mostly in the 40s south of the Brooks Range and uh, upper 30s to lower 40s again over southern Alaska with uh, mid 30s to the Copper River Basin. Some of the higher elevations dropping down toward freezing if you see the clearing and otherwise the Panhandle upper 30s to lower 40s, lower to mid 40s with uh, near 40 degree temperatures out over the Alaska Peninsula, lower 40s for the Aleutians, upper 30s to the Pribilofs, highs starting to creep back towards 70 over the northeast interior and upper 50s to mid 60s, so sit in the Valley, Kenai Peninsula, even the Copper River Basin, and warming also over the Panhandle, some afternoon sunshine, temperatures there in the lower to mid 60s. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Tuesday morning, flying weather looks uh, a lot IFR from the northern Colbuck, Koyukuk Valley. Yeah, northward across the Brooks Range all the way out to the Arctic coast and beyond then southward through the Bering Strait, uh, St. Lawrence Island, all of the eastern central Bering Sea and a narrow swath of marginal VFR across Adak and Atka and then back to the IFR from Amchitka and out to Shimiana too. Some IFR southwest uh, Shilakoff Strait and southern Cook Inlet from Ketchumak Bay over westward to just north of Kamishak Bay, and up the east side of the Kenai Peninsula, Western Prince William Sound, IFR, all the way up to the Talkeetnas, and then IFR across eastward across the coast range, Wrangell Mountains, marginal VFR, all of the, uh, well, all the way up into the Yukon Flats there, southward across the mid and upper Tanana Valley, 40 Mile Country, Copper River Basin, same thing for the Panhandle for the afternoon. VFR for the southeast coast uh, pulls a fair distance off the coast and stays marginal for uh, the North Gulf Coast, South Central Alaska, most of the Copper River Basin, improvement north of the Alaska Range, but still some areas of marginal VFR. IFR still holding pretty good, pulled back a little, but marginal VFR for the Kobuk Koyukuk Valley, IFR North Slope Arctic Coast, and the Northern and Western Bering Sea, IFR, Southern and Southeast Bering, and Bristol Bay, Alaska, Peninsula, Kodiak Island, and the Southwest Coast, pretty marginal. That holds through Wednesday as well. IFR though on the increase, central western Bering, and just about all the Aleutians starting out the day IFR through the Bering Strait. Same story, north slope, Arctic coast, same forecast. Uh, IFR back down south of the Brooks Range, northern Kobuk Koyukuk Valley's marginal VFR all the way down the central interior. And some uh, marginal VFR scattered around with some VFR scattered around and IFR scattered around for the north Gulf Coast into southern Alaska, but VFR for the Panhandle. Good VFR for Wednesday afternoon, southeast coast, and pulling off the north Gulf Coast. So a VFR afternoon coming up for southern Alaska, most of the interior, except over the Kobuk Koyukuk Valley, could be some marginal conditions persisting. And a lot of IFR out over the Bering Sea, but from Fox Islands to the Alaska Peninsula, marginal, southwest coast, marginal. And moving on to uh, passes, Anatovic starting out IFR, improving to only marginal VFR in the afternoon. That same forecast also uh, good for Adigan as well, IFR becoming marginal. Lake Clark and Merrill, marginal VFR at times tomorrow, same forecast for rainy and windy, mostly marginal VFR for all those passes. Isabel as well, marginal VFR. Mentasta though, starting out marginal, uh, optimistically becoming VFR in the afternoon. Tanita, marginal VFR, <clears throat> and Portage, IFR becoming marginal, a little bit of improvement there. Chilkoot and White starting out marginal becoming VFR, and four freezing levels, upper level ridging to the north there, up over the north slope and Arctic coast, so 8,000 feet there, and we've got uh, cooler temperatures across southern Alaska, lower freezing levels with uh, 2,000 feet from British Columbia in across the Copper River Basin, Mendes was sitting in the valley, and roughly about two to 3,000 feet until you get out in the uh, Bering Sea, it's mostly around 2,000, not much change there, but cool air to the south, warm air to the north. Icing, really not much going on. A few areas uh, I've got marked there, St. Matthew Island and the interior, possible mixed light to very isolated, moderate icing, uh, and the more general, general area there coming into the western and then Central Aleutians, uh, just again, isolated moderate rime icing, freezing low to 10,000 feet. <clears throat> Jet stream, upper level low, 
near the Pribilof still, gradually lifting northward. And uh, you can see the southeast winds coming around the east side of that low, going up and over the top of that big upper level ridge off the eastern Arctic coast. And then that low sliding eastward today across the pan, it'll move slowly eastward tomorrow with 70 knot jet cutting across Dixon entrance. Looks like that high will come southward over the next few days or actually build a little farther to the south as that Bering Sea low uh, drifts north and then northwest and dissipates. Another one cuts underneath. And 3,000 or 9,000 feet, 20 to 35 knot winds along the southwest coast. and. Otherwise, pretty light and variable over the interior and the panhandle as well as the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea as well. 3,000 feet, 20 to 30 knot winds there along the Yukon Delta Coast, St. Lawrence Island. Only 15 knots for the Alaska Peninsula. Weak claw on the Arctic Coast, maybe 20 knots at the most there. Turbulence, light to isolated moderate chop, southwest coast, western Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined once again by the science liaison of Gina Eric Stevens. Gina, of course, is the Geographic Information Network of Alaska based up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And Gina is all about satellites, and Eric mm -hmm. is always here to tell some really cool stuff about satellites. Now, the last time you were here, we talked mm -hmm. about how the weather satellites can see clouds and what's under the clouds, but you're telling me that satellites can do a lot more, even protect the, uh, the general public uh, with uh, aviation safety information. That's right. There's one particular aspect of satellites we're going to mm -hmm. talk about today that might not be immediately obvious, and that is detecting things in the atmosphere mm -hmm. that are not clouds, that are not snow, not rain, huh. but rather a hazard that can happen here in Alaska, and that is volcanic ash. Ah, of course. When okay. a volcano goes off, puts ash in the air, this is... Of course, a hazard to the public if the ash were to fall on the ground in, in accumulating amounts. Sure. Additionally, while the ash is in the air, and this is the more frequent hazard, is it's a hazard to aviation mm -hmm. because you cannot fly an airplane into volcanic ash without, without great risk. Worst case scenario, the ash gets into a jet engine, right. wrecks the engine, kills the engine, mm -hmm. and now you have an airplane flying with no engines. Right. It won't fly for long. So aviators need to avoid that ash. How do you avoid the ash? You have to know where it is mm -hmm. by identifying it with a satellite image and perhaps predicting then where the ash will flow with the overall weather patterns. Satellites are so important for identifying when a volcano goes off mm -hmm. and then tracking the ash after the, the volcano injects the ash into the atmosphere. Now, are you talking about seeing the heat signature or a huge volcanic plume with a cloud that we're used to seeing in the really pretty pictures of, of any Alaska volcano that's erupted recently, Redoubt, for example? Or are mm -hmm. we talking about the really fine details? Because this well, is polar orbiting satellites, the ones that are very low to the ground, right? Mm-hmm. The, the geostationary satellites can do some detection. The polar orbiters, like you say, they're mm -hmm. closer to the Earth. They mm -hmm. give the even better view. In answer to your question, mm -hmm. I would say all of the above. Oh, okay. A heat cool. signature from a volcano going off with all the, the heat that comes um, with the eruption, that mm -hmm. can be identified in infrared imagery. Okay. We've got images from the Kamchatka Peninsula. That's, that's the far eastern part of Russia mm -hmm. on the western side of the Bering Sea, loaded with volcanoes. Right. You know, Alaska has plenty of volcanoes of its own. We can also be affected when a, a volcano goes off in Kamchatka, say, mm -hmm. and then the weather carries that ash toward Alaska from the west. Right. You can see the, the infrared heat signature, like you say. Okay. Also, um, the ash in the air can be detected by doing some sophisticated uh, channel differencing within the satellite data. You can find the, uh, the identification of sulfur dioxide, say, that's a component of the volcanic okay. emission, mm -hmm. and you can trace this um, with the satellite imagery. Um, sometimes volcanoes go off that haven't gone off before, mm -hmm. and we're not expecting them to go off. Say if there's no seismometers around a given volcano that hasn't gone off in 100 years, you might not be expecting it to go off. And the satellite imagery, since satellites can be uh -huh. globally comprehensive, that might be the first sign that you have that a volcano oh, wow. in an unexpected area is going off. So it's a good backup system, okay. Right, wow. right, and, and people are working all the time on automating the, uh, the interrogation of satellite data by computers mm -hmm. to provide a, a first alert to a human to, so the software will say, we think this might be important human, go take a closer look, because right. the people are still the best way to, to interrogate the imagery, but the planet's a big place, and yes. we can't be looking everywhere all the time, so the software helps give a first, first cut. And then in Alaska, there's a special kind of surprise angle where the satellites are helpful, and that is um, the Katmai eruption mm -hmm. of 1912. 
um, huge eruption. There is still somewhat of a moonscape out there in southwest right. Alaska where all this ash is laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a, a strong weather pattern comes along where we have roaring northwest winds that go across the Alaska Peninsula there and can actually pick some of this ash up right. off the ground. No volcano is going off. This was more than 100 years ago that that volcano actually yeah. blew. So you're not going to see a heat signature like we were discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be no seismic signature of a volcano going off. So those data sets, they'll say, oh, no right. problem. Mm -hmm. But you can see in some of the satellite imagery this ash, as it's called, resuspended. Right. When the, the wind comes along, picks it up, the ash can be lofted a few thousand feet in the air just okay. with the wind. And an airplane flying into that plume is, is exposed to some danger. So we need to track right. that ash to provide guidance to aviators that you don't want to be flying here at these elevations in this area. We've got some imagery of the resuspension. And you can mm -hmm. see the wind blowing strongly from the northwest, picking up the ash and, and blowing it down to the southeast. Right. And so that's another perhaps not immediately obvious hazard of volcanic ash. It, Katmai is the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> for sure. Very good. So we've got satellites that, that can help us understand the weather uh, from the past and the immediate past. And we talked last time about how that's feeding into the forecast modeling to help improve mm -hmm. predictions. But mm -hmm. now they're also protecting the general public with aviation sensitive information and watching volcanoes, whether they're erupting or maybe have erupted in the past and finding the, the left behinds from, from those uh, volcanic events there. So really impressive stuff. Mm -hmm. Eric, thanks so much for joining us again today. And uh, you're a gift that keeps on giving from the satellite community. So <laughs> thanks a lot. And we hope to have you back again soon. Again, Eric Stevens with Gina at the University of Alaska. Fairbanks. And if you'd like to check out any of the information that uh, Eric has shared with us again today, you can do that very easily by going to www.gina.alaska.edu. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Uh, today's sea ice analysis. Ice still slowly fading away along the Yukon Delta coast and south of St. Lawrence Island, but uh, holding fast along the north shore there with those northerly winds. And that area over western Norton Sound from the uh, coast of uh, south coast of the Seward Peninsula, that uh, pretty much holding in a stationary status quo. Moving on to coastal water forecast, pretty light and variable along all of the coast tomorrow, five to 10 knots, seas uh, around five feet, give or take, and also light variable winds over the central and southern inside waters, no more than 10 knots with seas no higher than two feet. Lynn Canal, south winds in the afternoon, 20 knots, seas four feet, and for Wednesday, a little brisker winds now there on the south coast of the Panhandle, small craft advisories. East winds increasing to 25 knots, seas building to 8 feet. Otherwise, east northeast picking up to about 20 knots on the central coast, north coast, north at 15, seas 4 feet. Clarence Strait, southeast at 10 knots with 2 foot seas, north at 10 knots there for the Stevens Passage area, as well as Lynn Canal, seas running at about 2 feet. Prince William Sound, north winds at 10 knots with 2 foot seas. Variable winds at 10 knots for the North Gulf Coast, seas at about four feet, and south 15 for the Barren Islands, seas also four feet, and southeast winds for Kamishak Bay, seas four feet. Cook Inlet, south winds 15 knots, seas three to four feet. For Wednesday, Cook Inlet, southwest breeze, barely a breeze, 10 knots, seas three to four feet, northeast at 15 for Kamishak Bay, with the Barren Islands, winds will be out of the north at 15 knots, 3 foot seas. Light northwest winds for the North Gulf Coast, 15 knots, 3 to 4 foot seas. Light winds in Prince William Sound with slight seas. And for Kodiak Island on the east side, light winds out of the southwest at about 10. Shilikoff Strait, south 15. Bristol Bay, southeast 15. And the uh, Bering Sea side of the Seward Peninsula, south 20 knots, 6 foot seas. South side, southwest 15, six foot seas turn southerly as you approach Kodiak Island. And then for Wednesday, east winds at 15 for Bristol Bay, east northeast, only 10 knots for the Alaska Peninsula, seas three to seven feet, and northeast, 15 knots, Castle Cape up across Shelikoff Strait, and all of Kodiak Island, seas running six to eight feet. And for the Fox Islands tomorrow, southwesterlies 15 to 20 knots, five to six foot seas. Adak and Atka, not too bad. Southwest 15, five foot seas. 
and southerlies at 20 knots for the western Aleutians. Uh, those pick up, uh, especially in advance of that front, uh, could be a narrow band of minimum gales with that, but right now just going 30 knots should cover it pretty well from Amchitka Island over to Atka with uh, from the south and southeast, seas 8 to 11 feet, and for Unmak Island, small craft advisories on Alaska Island, south or east of southeast, 15 to 20 knots. And then for the southwest coast, uh, Yukon or Cuscom Delta Coast, south 20 knots, Perla southwest at 20, and then small craft advisories, Yukon Delta Coast, north of Nunavak Island, southeast 25 knots, east at 20 knots for St. Lawrence Island, and southeast at 10 for Norton Sound, northeast 15, St. Matthew Island. Wednesday, south 15, Norton Sound, and south to southeast 15 to 20 knots, strongest north of Nunavak Island for the southwest coast. Small craft advisories for the Perbolofs and St. Matthew Island. Winds southeast increasing to 25 knots. And up on the eastern Boulevard Sea coast, lighter winds now. East southeast at about 15 tomorrow. Light winds on the central coast with an easterly drift and then swinging back around to the west. For the west side, they're at 15 knots and variable 10 to 15 from Wales to Cape Beaufort. And for Wednesday, Wales to Cape Thompson, southeast 15, and then up to Cape Beaufort, southeast to 10. Really light variable winds along all the Beaufort Sea coast on Wednesday, 5 to 10 knots, and uh, they'll probably lead to some increasing low clouds and fog conditions. And uh, could see some of that probably overnight tonight. Uh, with some flurries possible on the east side, but none of that will amount to much. Uh, definitely IFR flying conditions into the Chuck CC, Bering Sea IFR with lots of uh, low clouds, fog, light rain, drizzle, showers, and showers on the decrease over the eastern interior of the state from the Brooks Range to the North Gulf Coast. And for tomorrow, showers mostly cloudy, showers more numerous in the afternoon hours. And next front pushing into the western Aleutians brings uh, wind and rain into the central Aleutians and starts to dry out and warm up over southern Alaska. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.